Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Hope everyone's having a great day. And it, you know, it's almost the weekend, right? So, welcome to our food sustainability webinar. You know, this is webinar number five of our food sustainability webinar series, which we have been doing over the last year or so. All of our previous food sustainability webinars are actually located on our iTech YouTube channel, which I will post a link to in the chat box. Just a couple quick logistics before we go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask that everyone stays muted for the duration of the webinar. If you unmute during during the webinar, I'm going to mute mute police you on my end. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions in the chat box during the speakers presentations. Speakers and I will actually go ahead and track will track the chat box so that way I remember who questions go with who. At the end of the at the end of the webinar, once the presenters have completed their presentations, I will go ahead and open up the floor for verbal questions. So if you do want to go ahead and save your questions to ask aloud, please go ahead and feel free to do that at the end versus asking in the chat box. With that, I will go ahead and get started and turn it over to our first presenter this afternoon, Ms. Taylor Gladwin with the City of Fayetteville. Taylor, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. It is a pleasure being here with you all today. I am an environmental educator in the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas's Recycling and Trash Division. Um, I've been here for a few years and my main job is working on our composting programs that we have here in the city. Um, and I'm also a, a graduate student earning my master's in sustainable policy and development. So I will go ahead and get started with my presentation. Food waste diversion in Fayetteville, local actions for a greener world. So we have to start with this with what is food waste exactly? Food waste is anything in your refrigerator or in your pantry that has gone bad and that you can no longer eat. Um, it is the parts of your food that you cannot eat, period, like your eggshells or your banana peels, things like that. Um, there is food waste um, at every part of food production, whether it be how you're making your meal or what's left over on your plate, um, anything that you can no longer eat that is food waste. So we have two food waste programs here in the city of Fayetteville. Um, our newest program is a residential program, and we also have a commercial food waste composting program. And both of those programs we accept the following items of food um, into, the, into our food waste carts. So that includes your vegetables, fruits, your coffee and coffee filters, um, processed goods, baked goods, and we even accept cooked meat and dairy products. And these are items that you wouldn't typically want to put in your backyard compost pile because they can attract rodents and other kinds of pests and generate a lot of smell. But because we have a commercial compost facility here in Fayetteville, we, our compost windrows get very hot um, and we can accept those harder to decompose items. You'll also notice that um, all the food on this slide is moldy. It's gone bad um, because ideally, of course, we want to reduce food waste before it starts. We want to donate edible food um, and so anything you're composting then would be something that cannot be eaten. So we have a really important goal here in the city of Fayetteville. Our goal is to reach 40% waste diversion from the landfill by 2027. We're currently at about 19, maybe 20% waste diversion. Um, and we wanna reach this goal uh, by three mean, main ways, and that is increased composting, increased recycling, and increased education and outreach. So that's educating folks um, about not only the services that we offer as a city, but also just how you can reduce waste before it starts. In Fayetteville specifically, we have about 18% of our waste stream is food waste. 
Um, and with us being right at about 19, 20% of waste diversion from the landfill, if we were to stop throwing away food, if we were to start composting all of our food waste as a city, we could almost be reaching our goal, um, which is a very notable point. But even more importantly, of course, we wanna keep that food waste out of the landfill, which I'll talk about more later. Um, so 18% of Fayetteville's waste stream is food waste, but as a country, we throw away almost 40% of the food that we produce, um, never even reaches our stomachs. And so that makes the United States the global leader in food waste. So our residential food waste program is something we're really proud of. It started at the beginning of 2020. And we, as you may imagine, we couldn't do too terribly much advertising for it um, since that is the year the pandemic started. So we really started ramping up promotion of that program further down the line of 2020. And it really took off in the, at the beginning of 2021. But it started in 2020. And this is a graphic that we share for that program. You can see we accept all the food items that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and we also accept your food soil paper. Um, so your napkins, for example, um, even brown paper sacks, and also we accept compostable products. There are really only a, um, a handful of residential food waste programs in the country, and even fewer of them accept compostable products. Um, and we're really happy to be one of those. one of those that do accept uh, compostable products. The compostable products that we accept include your paper-like compostables, like sugar cane um, to-go boxes, but we also accept bioplastics as well. We are a big stickler for those compostable products to be BPI certified. Um, BPI certification means that the compostable product was not intentionally made with PFAS, which PFAS are known as forever chemicals um, that cause all kinds of ailments and complications in the body. And we certainly don't want to put that into um, our compost that goes to grow residents' food that they will consume. So we educate businesses that purchase compostable products and make sure that those products are BPI certified. Um, basically, if you can eat it, you can compost it. The only things that we do not accept in our program are raw meat, um, non-food items such as plastic and metal, for example, but also we don't accept large quantities of oil, lard, um, grease, fat, things like that. If it's cooked into the food, that's fine, but if it's a jar of expired olive oil, for example, too much of that um, actually disrupts the decomposition process. So we, we don't accept those standalone items. But in our program, if you, can com if you can eat it, you can compost it. So part of our residential program is it's a drop-off program. Um, residents, they collect their food waste at home and then they bring it to one of our drop-off centers. This is the signage that you see at each of our drop-off centers. It's three easy steps to use the food waste drop-off. Open the lid, deposit your food waste, and close the lid. Um, and once again, there's plenty of education at all of our drop-off locations um, that let people know what we accept and what we do not accept in the program. We have currently five drop-off locations in the city, four of which are open 24-7. Um, and the fifth one is our compost facility, and that's open during um, operation hours. And we're working on establishing five more drop-offs at least this year um, to make it a well-rounded program. We're currently also working with our GIS department to make sure that those drop-offs are uh, equally spaced throughout the city and that they are along high traffic areas. So you don't have to be driving too far away from anything to get to a food waste drop off. Um, or maybe you're driving somewhere and you can visit the food waste drop off on your way. And also making sure that the food waste drop offs are, um, some of them at least are near the bike trail. So you could even ride your bike and, and drop off your food waste. This is a graphic of our residential food waste buckets. We give these buckets out for free to Fayetteville residents to help facilitate participation in our program. 
We have two sizes and buckets, three and a half and five gallon. The buckets come with a lid and these graphics on them that show you what is accepted in the program and what is not accepted in the program. The buckets also have a QR code, a website address, and a phone number in case you want in any more information on the program and also to get a list of where our drop-offs are located. These buckets were purchased with a grant we received from the USDA. Um, that's why we're um, big sticklers for following through with exactly the bucket intention. We ask people who receive a bucket to sign a commitment pledge, which is just a simple pledge that says they will use the bucket for its intended purpose, which is food waste collection, and that they will bring it to one of our drop-off locations so we can see an increase in tonnage that we collect. Um, we've given away about 500 buckets so far, and we have many more to go. Uh, we do bucket giveaways throughout the year. We also always have bucket giveaways, or we have buckets available to Fayetteville residents here at our transfer station. And this started um, in the spring of 2020 when we started giving out these buckets, and it really helps with participation. Um, you'd be surprised how, you know, removing that barrier of not having a container um, really enables people to bring us their food waste. So plenty of people have brought their food waste in a Tupperware and a plastic sack um, and just, you know, of course, emptied the contents of their container into our food waste carts. Um, but giving them a three and a half and five gallon option is makes it a lot more convenient for them based on their needs. Here are a couple of examples of our public food waste drop offs. The one on the left is the Yacht Club on College Avenue. Um, the Yacht Club is a food truck area where there's a few different food trucks serving food outside, and you can see all of the signage that we have. Um, the image on the right is Trinity United Methodist Church. They have a shed as well because their food waste carts are in their parking lot, so they're not really next to anything. So the shed um, works as a, a visual anchor for the food waste carts and also a way for us to hang up the signage that goes with the food waste carts um, that says this is not a trash can. This is only for food waste. This is what we accept and things like that. Both of these drop offs are open 24 seven. We work in um, a partnership with each of our business partners who are kind enough to be a food waste drop off. We supply them with the carts, the BPI certified compostable bags, all of the signage, a shed if they should want it, and also a trash grabber. Because one of the things we ask of them is that they monitor the carts periodically throughout the day to make sure that they're not generating a lot of contamination. And contamination would be um, really anything that's not a food item. We haven't had any problems with raw meat, for example, finding its way into the cart. Um, but every now and then there will be a plastic bag, a plastic cup, things of that nature. So we ask the business to monitor the carts and um, pick that out if they see anything like that. We also want to make sure that our business partners have a large enough parking lot to accommodate this. You know, it can accommodate cars coming in and out and simply dropping off food waste and then being on their way. These are images of our public food waste drop offs at each of our recycling centers. So the recycling centers is an obvious place to have a food waste drop off cart. We have two recycling centers in Fayetteville, one in the central part of town and one in the south part of town. And they both have the food waste drop off carts there. These are 65 gallon carts and we have extra carts on site as well. Um, these are also both open 24 seven and there are attendants here. Um, five days a week that can help answer questions about food waste or recycling that we have on site. And these drop offs get a lot of action um, since we've started this program. And since we have started handing out the food waste buckets, we have seen an uptick in the amount of food waste we're diverting from the landfill every quarter, um, which is exactly what we want to do. So we're, we're really proud to be making that difference and to be keeping that food waste out of the landfill. And our residents are really, of course, happy to participate in that as well. 
Now some of the benefits of composting your food waste. This is without a doubt my favorite part to talk about and you know why I find this program to be so important. So when you compost your food waste, instead of sending it to the landfill, you reduce the amount of methane going into the atmosphere and you also reduce the amount of trash you're generating. So on the note of methane, when food waste, when food in general goes into the trash can, it goes to a landfill where it gets buried in the earth and it goes through a process known as anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion is decomposition without oxygen. There is no oxygen in the landfill. Um, landfills were built to store our trash, not to degrade it. So because they pack the trash down so tightly in the landfill, there simply isn't any room for oxygen. So when the food waste and other organic materials decompose in the landfill very slowly, they produce methane, which is of course a very potent greenhouse gas, 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide at warming our planet, and of course contributing to climate change. So that's what happens when we throw food away. Um, and of course, also by not throwing food away, you're reducing the amount of trash you make. So you're having to take your trash out less frequently, and you're also not having as smelly a trash. And here in Northwest Arkansas, we only have one landfill. We have one landfill um, in Tawny Town, and they service all of Northwest Arkansas and parts of Missouri as well. And so when our landfill runs out, um, we're gonna have to find another place to put our trash which is going to um, increase our residents' trash bill, um, especially since we would have to send that trash out of state to someplace like Oklahoma, for example. That is if they were to even accept our trash and agree to that, because the EPA has said that, um, I'm sorry, ADEQ um, has said that we can build no more landfills in Northwest Arkansas because we have cave systems beneath this part of the state that make us more susceptible to groundwater pollution. So we are not going to be having any more landfills in this part of the state. So we need to preserve the life of the one landfill that we do have. Composting your food waste also gives you the potential to save money on your waste management. In Fayetteville, we have a pay as you throw system. So the more you throw away, the more you pay. If you have a larger trash cart, you pay more. If your trash can, if your trash cart is smaller, you pay less. Um, so if you're able to take something out of your trash can, may it be through composting or recycling, you have the potential to downgrade the size of your trash cart and therefore save money. So, and as well, composting food waste, um, of course, in your backyard or through our residential program here in Fayetteville, it's completely free. This is a completely free program. The buckets we give out are free. Using the drop off is free. Um, so there's no charge there. For businesses specifically, composting gives them a competitive advantage. Sustainability is makes you competitive as a business these days. Now, perhaps more than ever, consumers are aligning themselves with businesses that have a mission they can support. Um, that's 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 a very important factor. And so being able to say, we compost as a business, we recycle as a business, that very well may make somebody want to spend their money at your business, or it may make someone want to work for you. So that's something I always point out when speaking with our commercial businesses is that this makes you competitive. Composting, of course, reduces the effects of climate change. Not only does composting your food waste keep methane emissions out of the atmosphere, but when you turn that food waste into compost and you use it in your gardens, you are actually making your plants stronger and healthier and therefore able to absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When we add compost to our gardens, we fill our gardens up with organic matter that is rich in macro and micronutrients that our plants need in order to be healthy, to be delicious, and to absorb more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. When you bite into a tomato um, or an apple and you think this tastes like a tomato should taste like, this tastes delicious, it's because that tomato was grown in healthy soil. That's what you're tasting is nutrients in the soil. 
And so we want our food to taste better. We want our plants to be stronger using compost instead of a traditional fertilizer, for example. It helps balance the pH of your soil. It helps with water retention, and it also helps release those nutrients to your plants as they need them. Um, and the compost, it has not only the nutrients that you get with other types of fertilizer, like nitrogen and phosphorus, but also it has zinc and iron and calcium and magnesium and a ton of macro and micronutrients that plants need to be delicious and to be strong. And composting helps maintain a beautiful community. Um, we sell our compost back to residents in the community at large for a very competitive price. We sell two and a half cubic yards, which is about the amount that can fit in the back of a, a truck bed um, for $35. That's for our food waste compost. We also make yard waste compost here in Fayetteville. That is no food waste, just yard waste, and that is $25 for the same amount. It's a little bit less expensive because it doesn't have all the nutrients that food waste, our food waste compost does. So by selling that back to the community, um, and it is, it's a very popular product, we are frequently out of it and we encourage people to always call ahead when they wanna come pick some up. Um, so by having that available to the community, they can use it in their gardens. So it encourages backyard gardening, it encourages healthy eating and healthy activities. Um, so that is what we do with our final compost product as we sell it back to the community. We also give it to our parks and rec department, especially the mulch that we make for use in garden beds. And when we have schools participating in food waste collection, um, that's currently on pause right now with the pandemic, but we're hoping, hoping to start it again in the fall. Those schools that are collecting food waste for composting we bring them compost to use in their gardens free of charge. So the students can see the full circle effect of what they haven't eaten on their tray, going into their food waste cart, coming back to their school in a few months as compost, and then going back into their garden to grow more food. And that can be used as part of their science curriculum as well. As well as the food waste, food waste buckets, through that USDA grant that we received, we were able to purchase a mobile compost education trailer. So this is uh, one side of our food waste trailer that we bring to events and festivals and um, other kinds of environmental education opportunities within the city. It's decked out from head to toe in food waste and compost education. And it also houses all of our supplies when we go to these events, our easy up tables, tons of buckets, for example. And we get to, it's another education point for people to get to see and check out. This is the other side of the trailer. We are at the farmer's market here in Fayetteville twice a month on the fourth Tuesday and Saturday of the month, starting in April and going until um, November. And we're giving out buckets at the Fables Farmer Market. We are talking about our compost programs, as well as answering questions about recycling and sustainability in general. Um, we're there for a few hours to hand out these buckets to Fayetteville residents and to talk about our programs and how people can help and what you can do at home and what we're doing as a city as well. And with the buckets um, specifically, the buckets are not required to participate in our residential drop-off program. You don't even have to be a Fayetteville resident to participate in the program. All you have to do is, of course, only put accepted items, um, food that you can eat into the food waste carts and keep non-edible items out. That's all, that's, our, that's all we ask. You don't have to use a bucket or even live here. So if you're ever coming through and you're gonna go to the recycling center to drop off your cans in your car, if you've got food waste, you can drop that off as well. I did wanna include some tips on how to stop food waste. That's a really important part of our program is reducing waste before it starts. Um, so I was able to find uh, learn some cool things from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, freezing your food is a great way to save it before it goes bad. You can freeze a lot of different kinds of foods, including bread and vegetables, also nuts, and even certain kinds of flour can be put in the freezer. 
um, by going to the grocery store and then putting your meat products directly into your freezer or your fridge is a great way to keep them fresh. And as you can see on this slide, um, it takes a lot of water to make a pound of beef, for example. And so not letting those foods go bad, putting them directly into the fridge when you're when you get home with them um, is a great way to keep them fresh and lasting longer and saving water that way. You can also soak your vegetables in water and it'll revive wilted vegetables. This is something I've done myself. I know it works well with celery. And so if you have some limp celery that you think is no good anymore, put it in the put it in a jar of water overnight um, or even for 10 minutes and you'll see that celery stiffen up again and it'll be good and crunchy. A really interesting tip I found was to put items in specific places in your refrigerator. So proper placement in the fridge is another tip. Um, the bottom of the refrigerator is the coldest. And so that's where you wanna put your dairy products and your meat products um, to keep them from spoiling any sooner. And it gets, the refrigerator gets warmer as you move up. So you wanna put more perishable things um, kind of up towards the top, maybe butter, for example, if you have your butter in your refrigerator, that can go on the top of the fridge. And then the door of the refrigerator is the warmest part. And that's why we keep condiments there and things like that. Also a tip, um, your leftover food that you have, you might wanna move that to the front of the fridge so you don't forget that's there, so you can eat that sooner before it goes bad. And then of course, make a list. You know, it's always easy to, um, buy extra things when we're hungry at the grocery store, things that we may not end up eating and may end up going bad. Um, so making a list and only buying what you use is another way to reduce food waste. So our residential food waste program was born from our commercial food waste program, which that started in 2016 as a pilot program we had a handful of businesses participating in the program, as well as a few Fayetteville Public Schools, and also the University of Arkansas was part of our pilot program as well. Uh, by 2018, we had that as a full program open to any business wanting to participate. This is the graphic that we have for our commercial food waste program. We accept all the same stuff, of course. It's all going to the same place. It's all coming to us. Um, and that has been really beneficial to helping us get more businesses composting their food waste. We currently have about 40 businesses, including a few sororities at the U of A, uh, participating in our commercial food waste program. We had some drop off during the pandemic, um, but we've been able to see them come back online, which has been wonderful. The services that come with our commercial food waste program we give the business a 65 gallon food waste cart with a locking lid. And when that food waste cart is picked up and inverted, it unlocks. So when the cart is picked up by our food waste truck um, and it is put upside down to be emptied into the back of the truck, that lock automatically unlocks. We have three pickups per week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. So we're picking up the food waste carts, we're servicing the food waste carts 12 times a month. We also, of course, we supply the first six months of BPI certified compostable bags. These compostable bags are really important. They keep the carts clean and they also just keep the smell down and keep pests out. Um, and then when it's freezing outside, the bags actually help the food waste from freezing to the cart. And when that happens, the food waste doesn't come out of the cart, we've learned. So the bags are really important. And we supply the business with the first six months worth of bags. And we always have bags on hand in case a business hasn't received their order and needs some more bags before their next order of bags comes through. We wanna keep them composting, of course, and using the right bag. So we always have some here at the office. So all of this for just $15.58 a month. Um, so that's a little over $15 for 12 monthly pickups. So that equates to a little bit over a dollar per pickup. Um, and it's our hope that by diverting food waste from the business's trash can, 
will save them money and then that will help pay for this service. Um, we definitely want to use economics to the environment's advantage. So our recycling and composting services are a fraction of the cost of trash here in the city of Fayetteville. We run our own we run our own trash program. We run our own recycling and composting programs. So we have the benefit of being able to set those prices, do the education, um, and just really be ahead of those programs and let them work to our advantage. And we certainly want to incentivize waste reduction and waste diversion more than trash disposal. Here are some images of how we make our food waste compost. The image on the left is how the process starts. We build a pad, which is a mixture of 50% yard waste and 50% ground wood chips. And then we pour the food waste on. Over the um, course of a few weeks, we build up a food waste windrow, which is a fancy, a windrow is a fancy word for a long compost pile. The image on the left, those green bags, those are BPI certified bags, of course. And then after a few weeks, when we have a, a large windrow built up, we'll, we see what we have on the right here of the screen. Um, that is our com one of our compost windows. We can have about six out there at a time. And then on the other side of our compost pad, we have our yard waste compost. Um, but in this picture with the row turner, that machine goes on top of the windrow and it goes up and down the food waste row about three times, and it turns everything from the outside of the pile inward, everything inward, outward, completely turns the, the compost pile. And we only do this um, about three times in the beginning. And that is, we only have to do it that little amount because we add an inoculant to our pile after a few weeks. Um, the inoculant is something that we get from a company called Harvest Quest. It's a blend of beneficial bacteria and fungi that we add to the pile at different points. And that, that inoculant allows our, com our materials, the food waste, of course, but also the compostable products to break down faster. The inoculant is what really helps our windrows get very hot. We monitor the temperatures of our compost piles every day at different depths and at different points um, of, along the pile. And they have to be at least, they have to be 131 degrees Fahrenheit for two weeks um, consecutively in order to meet our EPA standards. But our windrow piles, they are at least 145 degrees at any point in time. They can even reach as high as 165 degrees. And when we add the inoculant, it pulls in oxygen from outside the pile into the inside and produces steam, which is what you see here in this image. Um, and that really cooks the pile and all that bacteria just populates and helps break down the food waste and materials inside. Um, so that's a, a very beneficial thing we add. And because we add that inoculant, it allows us not to turn the pile as frequently because it's pulling in oxygen, the inoculant is. And so by not having to turn the pile as frequently, we save on um, gas consumption for that road turner, for example. So that's an environmental benefit of using this well. And then the image on the right is our screener. After the, the compost piles have sat for a couple of months, they go through this screener and it shifts out, it screens out any large debris, um, any large pieces of plastic or large pieces of wood. And then after that, the pile cures for about another month. And then in three months total time, we have a finished food waste product that we can sell back to the community. And like I said, it is um, a very popular product and we're just so glad that we um, have this program that we can give residents and the community a way to dispose of their food waste in a way that makes it a resource. And we can divert that food waste from the landfill, um, not only to help reach our waste diversion goal, but to make a greener world. That is all I have. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Taylor. City of Fayetteville is doing some really cool stuff. 
Um, if anybody has any questions for Taylor, you feel free to put those in the chat box at any time. Or you're, oh, you can wait until the next presenter is done and then you can ask those questions verbally. So, with that, I'll turn it over to our next presenter, Mary Bell Zook and Summer Wilkie with the University of Arkansas, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Mary and Summer, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. As I'm getting our PowerPoint up, I just wanted folks to have the opportunity to put in the chat where they're from so we can kind of get to know who all is here. I'm really impressed by the crowd. Thank you all so much for being here today. Oh, someone's from Shawnee. I'm in Shawnee too, Rebecca. We'll get into our intros as those are coming in um, so you guys can kind of know who we are and where we're from. So, Bojo, uh, Mary Bell's Zuck Nadezhnikos. Miigwech. Hello, and thank you for having me. My name is Mary Bell Zuck. I am a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, and I am the Communications Manager and Program Specialist at the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative at the University of Arkansas School of Law. Wow, we have some folks from all over the place. Yeah, very cool to see. Um, yeah. Uh, like Mary Bell was saying, we're at the University of Arkansas too. So uh, we're located in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, so that's a funny coincidence. It was great to hear your presentation today, Taylor. Um, really, really glad we all got to learn about that today. Um, I'm Summer Wilkie. I am a Cherokee Nation tribal citizen. Um, I'm in Fayetteville, like I said. Uh, it's the homeland of the Osage, Caddo, Quapa, Tunica, state of Arkansas, um, present day state of Arkansas. And um, the University of Arkansas is a land grant institution. So um, we uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the theft and coercion of indigenous land. And we acknowledge that. And um, just really grateful um, to be able to do the work that we are doing for indigenous people out of our uh, law school at um, the University of Arkansas. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I think um, I will, our presentation today is going to be, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative came to be here at the University of Arkansas. Um, we'll share some of our projects and programs. We do so many different things, um, but we'll try to keep it concise. And uh, then, of course, any questions for us or for Taylor, uh, we would love to hear from you more. And I'm just really impressed by uh, the diversity, uh, geographical diversity uh, on our on our call today, and and um, excited to share with you all what we do, and hope that it will be hopefully um, useful to you. So, um, the founding of our um, initiative uh, was uh, we were in it, we were created, I guess, by. Um, University of Arkansas Law School Dean Emeritus Stacy Leeds, who is also a Cherokee Nation citizen, and then um, our founding director Janie Sims Hip. They started this program in 2013, and Stacy um, made history at, at that time. Whenever she became the first Native American dean of um, any law school in um, 2011, I guess, and so. Um, then in 2013, the um, IFAI, as we call it, was um, started. And since that time, Janie Hip has moved on to serve 
presently as a general counsel for the United States Department of Agriculture. So we're really proud of that legacy of indigenous leadership and um, we're following through on their vision for um, the indigenous food and agriculture initiative. Um, all the work that we do helps provide strategic legal analysis, policy research, and educational resources that focus on empowering indigenous farmers um, and uh, upholds our mission to enhance health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural food traditions in Indian country. Every single day, IFAI's efforts support food and tribal sovereignty. Um, and then um, our presentation today, um, I guess we just wanna begin by highlighting a few of our recent projects. So um, I'll hand it over to Mary to let her talk about some of those. Thanks, Summer. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to start out with some of the things that uh, we've been working on most recently, and I wanted to highlight what we call internally our hunger report. Um, the, at the coronavirus pandemic's onset, IFAI began compiling resources to help increase food access and tackle some of the food availability issues. Um, the pandemic has shown a light on the need for greater food sovereignty and access across the United States, but I think this is especially true in Indian country. Uh, we recently partnered with the Native American Agriculture Fund and the Food Research and Action Center to conduct a survey of Native American food access during the pandemic. And we helped compile these findings in a recently released report titled Reimagining Hunger Responses in Times of Crisis, Insights from Case Examples, and a Survey of Native Communities Food Access During COVID-19. We like really long titles for things, but capturing data in Indian country is key to reclaiming food security and sovereignty, and it's important for lawmakers and others to prioritize native driven data and um, native control data. But I just wanted to highlight a few of the survey's key findings, which you can see on the PowerPoint presentation here. Um, almost half of Native American and Alaska Native survey respondents reported experiencing food insecurity during the pandemic. 48% indicated that sometimes or often during the pandemic, the food their household bought just didn't last and they didn't have money to get more. 37% of individuals indicated that in at least one month during the coronavirus pandemic, they or other adults in the household had to cut the size of meals or skip meals because there wasn't enough money for food. And 34% of individuals indicated that they ate less than they should because there wasn't enough money for food. Um, food insecurity rates are also statistically significantly higher for respondents with children under 18 in their household. Um, I think some of these stats are just absolutely heartbreaking and really point out the need that we have in Indian country to have more access to food and to really look at ways that Indian country can increase our food security. So moves me into our next project, which is the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, Data collection is also key to supporting American food, so Native American food sovereignty through IFAI's work as the research partner for the Native Food or Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, stats like the ones found through the recent survey and report help provide keen insight into potential tribal provision opportunities in the 2023 Farm Bill. Um, since the coalition's launch in 2017. More than 170 tribes, intertribal groups, and other Native organizations and non-Native allies have come have become members of the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Together, the members developed the coalition's priorities for the Farm Bill and kept Congress focused on tribal concerns. And thanks to the coalition's research, education, and advocacy at the U.S. Capitol and across the country, uh, the 2018 Farm Bill was signed into law and included 60 three separate provisions that benefit Indian country. And this is huge because this has never happened before. So here are just a few of the highlights from the last farm bill. We got increased tribal parity through 638 tribal self-governance demonstration projects for food distribution on Indian reservations, FDIPR, or most commonly known as the Commods program. 
access to funding by including tribal parity and inclusion for access to broadband programs across Indian country and increased the broadband program from only $25 million to $325 million. Training and infrastructure by establishing permanent baseline funding for combined farming opportunities training and outreach program for beginning and socially disadvantaged producers. Um, we also saw a lot of move forward and technical assistance and outreach by the codification of the existence of access to federal agency resources and TA for tribal promise zones, as well as traditional and native produced foods by providing more opportunities for tribes and tribal producers to participate in international US trade delegations. And after successfully helping shape the 2018 Farm Bill, the coalition has remained active and continues to advocate on behalf of Indian country interest. This involves working with the United States Department of Agriculture on implementation of new tribal authorities and access under the Farm Bill. And the coalition continues to educate policymakers on native nutritional and agricultural issues, assisting in oversight activities and urging Congress to further expand its recognition of tribal self-determination authority. And with the 2023 Farm Bill on the horizon, the coalition will continue to advance native policy priorities as Congress begins discussing the upcoming legislation. And as a founding partner of the Native Farm Bill Coalition, IFAI has had the opportunity to co-host several Native Farm Bill Coalition webinars recently. Um, our director is actually leading the one tomorrow. If you'd like to join in on that, she's gonna be covering the nutrition title. And staff across IFAI have been looking into each of the Farm Bill titles, there's 12 of them. And they've been doing research to, to compile a, another report this year. You can see on the PowerPoint from 2018, we worked on that report, Regaining Our Future, and it includes information um, for each title there and some of the things that would benefit tribes. Um, so we're working on that and should have that published later this summer. But you can find the one for 2018 at the link below or on our website, which is indigenousfoodandag.com. And you can actually also find more information on the Native Farm Bill Coalition, um, any roundtables. There's a lot going on right now, and I know our staff have been all over in the nation. But if you would like us out to your tribal community to get input from tribal producers and, and the tribes around you, please reach out. I know that they would love to go out um, and get to know some of the things that are going on in Indian country. So. I also wanted to highlight our recent cooperative agreement. Uh, we recently signed a cooperative agreement with USDA as part of the USDA's Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative that has a goal to promote traditional foodways, um, Indian country food and ag markets, and health through foods tailored to Native Americans' dietary needs. Because of our reputation as the leading research and policy expert regarding Indigenous food and ag, USDA selected IFAI. IFAI, sorry, to collaborate on the Government Empowerment Self-Governance Co-Management Project. So right now we are working to re review regulations that empower self-governance and provide tribal governments, producers, and food businesses with educational resources, policy research, and strategic legal analysis as a foundation for building robust food economies. Um, partnership with USDA's Office of Tribal Relations, IFAI will produce a report on legislative and regulatory proposals needed to empower tribal self-governance within USDA food programs. In addition, in addition to the recent projects just mentioned, IFAI's work uplifts Native American tribal and food sovereignty throughout a handful of areas and programs. So I just wanted to start by listing a few of the programs that we have. Um, like Summer mentioned earlier, we are involved in a lot, so we just tried to get some of the most important things to highlight today. Like the, the Model Tribal Food and Ag Code Project, it serves as a resource for tribal governments, providing a comprehensive set of model laws for review, adoption, and implementation. The model laws contained in the code were designed by IFAI and contributing attorneys to facilitate ag production, food system, development and health outcomes improvement across Indian country. You can sign up for access to some of those um, codes on our website, indigenousfoodandag.com. And I want to highlight food safety. So the Food Safety Modernization Act was passed in a law in 2014 to further the food safety of produce intended for public consumption. 
The U.S. Food and Drug Administration was tasked to develop and implement regulations related to the act. This uh, included in this is a comprehensive effort to train growers and suppliers so that they can meet certification requirements. In understanding and implementing produce safety practices are important to the safety of fruits and vegetables and to the viability of farm businesses. And sorry if you hear my dog in the background, she's decided to be loud now. <laughs> produce safety practices may be required by some buyers and some farms may be subjected to federal regulation. So you can get on our website um, and see some of the things that we've done in the past. And if it's something that you're interested in learning more about in the, in the realms of food safety, um, I know that we've been looking for another food safety specialist. So hopefully we'll be out in the field doing trainings, going out to tribes and tribal producers to, to get folks up to date on this. So look forward to that. And if you're interested in having us come out, reach out to us. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it back over to Summer. Hi again, everyone, and Mary, we couldn't hear your dog, so you sounded good. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to share with you all uh, some of our youth programs. That's um, the main component of my involvement, my position with the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative. Um, we want to help support and prepare the next generation of Native agriculturalists. Um, and we have multiple opportunities for youth this summer to gain impactful experiences in indigenous food and agriculture. Um, those are through the two programs, our Native Youth and Food and Agriculture Leadership Summit and the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Policy Leadership Program. And you have the dates there, but a little bit more about them. Um, this summer, we are planning to host um, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian youth ages 18 to 24, including recently graduated high school seniors. Um, these participants will be chosen and to attend the 2022 Native Youth in Food and Agriculture Leadership Summit. And that's gonna be held here at the University of Arkansas campus in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, from July 19th to the 26th. And then um, we are, some of the curriculum um, will be um, split into these four subject matter areas, the agricultural business and finance track, um, land stewardship and conservation, agricultural law and policy and nutrition and health. Um, but then everyone who attends the summit will get some some um, information and education related to all of these subject areas. Um, while they're at the summit, though, um, depending on uh, which track they choose to specialize in, um, they're going to get instruction from um, um, experts in the field and. We partner with the Intertribal Agriculture Council to um, help lead some of these education, uh, some of the education in these tracks, and um, then they will learn skills throughout the week to apply to a capstone project, um, working together in a small group. And then um, some other highlights of the summit this summer uh, that we have on the agenda are we're going to be visiting the Osage Nation to see their bison ranch and aquaponic facilities. So we have a field trip. And then we are also going to be visiting the Fayetteville Farmers Market, which is incredible. And students always love that every year. Um, and uh, we plan to prepare a meal with an indigenous chef uh, Nico Albert, who is a, also Cherokee, um, and uh, she emphasizes using indigenous ingredients in her cooking. So really excited about that. Happy to share that with you. Um, the next um, program that I want to highlight is um, the um, indigenous food and agriculture policy leadership program. Sorry, Mary, maybe go back. I thought there was another slide. <laughs> um, the leadership policy leadership program is um, going to allow students to um, get hands on ex uh, policy experience to understand um, how a policy can be shaped by anyone. Um, and we're going to do that by modeling um, the development of and the passing of a farm bill into law. We're going to be focusing on uh, Title V of the farm bill. 
um, because we want to emphasize um, access to um, access to um, capital and um, how to finance indigenous agriculture. So um, definitely uh, that that part of the event is also open to 16 to 18 year olds. Um, so if you know anyone in the ages of 16 to 24 who would be interested in participating in these programs this summer, um, we would love to have them join us. And the best part is that the um, participation, if they're accepted, is completely free. We um, have travel scholarships for accepted participants. Um, and we provide food and lodging and care at the University of Arkansas campus while they're here. And our applications are open until April 17th. So um, please share this with youth and um, I'll put my email in the chat if anyone has any questions about it or um, just want more information, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, okay, so now next slide, sorry, Mary. <laughs> I was um, also wanting to share some about our campus involvement. Um, at the University of Arkansas, we have um, over 900 Native American and Alaska Native students enrolled this semester. And so it's important for us to help provide a welcoming environment and a supportive network for Indigenous students. Um, as an alum of the University of Arkansas, I'm really pleased to be able to help make sure that we recognize those students and um, especially during graduation each semester. And uh, we work closely with the diversity, equity, and inclusion administration on our campus to recognize those graduates. And uh, we'll continue to do that in the future to help you know, promote uh, retention and, and persistence. And um, we are also um, supportive of student initiatives like the Native American Student Association and the newly formed, newly reformed Native American Law Students Association. Um, me and a coworker are both advisors for these, these student groups. And um, we just, you know, we show up and come out for students when they're planning events. Some events that the students planned in the last year were stickball, uh, movie nights, and yoga. And um, I also keep a mailing list uh, to share opportunities with students that we call the Native American Student Network. Um, so um, I just wanted to highlight uh, that we also are working closely with our administration and student affairs staff to uh, help continually improve the support and awareness for Indigenous students on our campus and um, help them succeed and have a sense of belonging while they're here. So that's a pleasure and a part of my job with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Go ahead and go to that. Yeah, thank you. So um, another thing, um, at IFAI that is so important to us is cultivating and supporting tribal sovereignty. Um, we have trainings and webinars to help support tribal food and agriculture sovereignty, along with um, educating and supporting youth to be prepared to you know, step into these leadership roles. So um, reach out to us just for more support um, or uh, you know, if there's anything we can do to help you related to tribal sovereignty, um, because uh, we have um, you know well-trained indigenous attorneys um, who are available to to help provide that. Uh, I also want to share with you um, another resource that's cool that we have is um, uh, our Eats Academy. Um, we have a variety of resources to help tribal producers make informed decisions around starting or expanding their operation. We have videos and downloadable resources to help tribes and tribal producers learn about opportunities to scale up their production, along with tools for beginning farmers interested in starting a farm to school program or exploring how to just finance their operation. 
our resource banking worksheets can help tribes and tribal producers make informed decisions about what to prioritize in determining the direction of their tribal agribusiness by inventorying their available resources to maximize utility or um, to maximize revenue generation. Um, there are also resources to help you navigate regulatory considerations when scaling up or just when getting started. The prospect of scaling up might seem misaligned with indigenous economies, but no matter what type of market a farmer or rancher engages in, scaling up is useful framework for developing efficiencies and expanding inputs to broaden or deepen your market research, either by tapping into larger numbers of markets, producing more for distribution at current markets, or just simply improving the energy or resource use of, um, efficiency of your operation. Um, definitely check out the tools that we have under the EATS Academy tab on our website, um, and then some of those can also be found in our video library. I also wanted to point out specifically the Tribal Hemp program, um, the support that we offer for Tribal Hemp. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill provided the opportunity for tribes and tribal producers to begin cultivating industrial hemp. And many tribes and producers have begun cultivation in the past few years and even more are interested. So um, we have developed resources and training to assist with understanding the logistics and legalities to consider for developing industrial hemp production, including a tribal um, model tribal hemp code as part of our uh, food code that um, Mary Bell mentioned earlier. And these web um, these resources can be found on our website as well. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back now to Mary Bell to wrap things up. Hi, everyone again. I realized my video wasn't on earlier, so I was just talking to, you know, blank screen, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so just to kind of wrap up our presentation today, we create educational resources and conduct research and policy analysis for child nutrition, food access programs in Indian country, as well as conduct policy analysis for ways to improve food security and access for all Native Americans. Um, in fact, a bunch of our staff have been in DC this week to assist with the USDA tribal consultation and the tribal caucus for tribal leaders. And that's uh, regarding the food distribution program on Indian reservations, the dipper or commands. I mentioned it earlier. And this document on the left is actually a document that helps folks know the pathway to the dipper, the history of it, and some of the positive um, stories that we've had recently. There have been numerous tribes that have been able to use this to incorporate traditional foods into their commands program. And in turn, they're also seeing the local producers, the local fishermen and women, the local business owners. So not only are folks getting culturally relevant, healthy foods, it's helping create local economies too. So it's been really cool to see that grow. And we're hopeful that in Farm Bowl 2023, that um, there'll be more room for that. More tribes will take this on. And I also wanted to highlight um, something that we did in January, we helped out with another USDA tribal caucus, um, and we're able to work with tribes to know what are some of the barriers that are happening? What are some of the things that y'all need to be able to be successful in creating a more localized meat and, um, poultry and seafood supply chain. I think that all of us at some point in the past few years have gone to the grocery store and seen that it's hard to get certain products. And so uh, we worked with tribes and tribal producers just to think of, of ways of mitigating that and ways that USDA can help make it more accessible for tribes and tribal producers to um, create processing facilities and trainings and things of that nature. So, I mean, honestly, all of our work could really fall under this, this headline because everything we do is to help food security and food access across Indian, Indian country because if we can't truly feed ourselves, we can't truly be sovereign. So it's a big part of what we do. Um, wanted to also show you ways that you can stay up to date with us. We've mentioned our website, but there's also our handles to our social. 
the links are I'll go and we'll try and repaste and see if um, we can make them work. Sorry, I just saw that the links aren't working for everyone. Um, but here are our social links. You can go follow us. You can also go on our website and sign up for our newsletters that we send out regularly so you can stay up to date on all things happening food and ag wise across Indian country. And I just wanted to then close with a miigwech. Thank you for having us today. We truly appreciate it. And if there's anything that we can do in the future or um, any ways that we could partner with you or if you're interested in more information, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary and Summer. These are some great resources you guys provided. It's awesome. So it looks like oh, I'm checking the chat box now. <laughs> there are some issues with the sharing links. So um, I don't know. It seems like it's a security thing because we're using a WebEx through the Cherokee Nation server, maybe because yeah. all the links are the same. Um, on my end, anyway, that it's like a. I'm gonna click on one myself just to see. Oh, on the site, yeah. It does say that. So <laughs> interesting. I'm gonna copy it and see if it works. If I like copy the link, I'll try that real quick. While we're doing that, does anyone does anyone have any? Okay, so if you copy the link, just copy the link and post it into your um, like Google Chrome or Internet Explorer, and that works. So you can do that. Just copy, copy and paste the link into Google Chrome. Yeah, that worked for me too. But also just if any of you have questions, feel free to, um, I put my email in the chat or um, reach out to any of us. And um, yeah. we'd be happy to help connect you with the resources you're looking for. Yeah, or you guys are more than welcome to email me as well and I can connect you that way as well. Does anyone have any questions for either either of our presenters, Mary, for Summer or for Taylor, and you, you're more than welcome to unmute yourselves as, as well. Getting some good feedback in the chat box though. Taylor, it was really cool to hear about some of the stuff going on in Fayetteville. I know like Summer and I were talking in a side chat that it's definitely something we're gonna take advantage of now, so. Yes, please do. Um, call me anytime. Come get a food waste bucket or I'd be glad to bring one to you. It was also really phenomenal to learn what you guys are doing. I'm really impressed and just still very empowered by that knowledge. And thank you guys for all that you do. Like I'm I'm following you on Instagram now. I've got your links pulled up and I look forward to learning more. <laughs> yes, very good information from all of you. Um, Taylor, Mary, Summer. Thank you guys all for joining us today. I really appreciate you guys, you guys coming on. And if you guys need anything in the meantime, or if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And um, this PowerPoint will be on the YouTube channel eventually in the next couple of weeks, probably. Thank you guys. Have a Thank good you. rest of the week. Thanks Thank so much. much.